now. Great. Hi, welcome to the Mango Publishing Heart Wisdom panel. I am Cherry Riker Blue, author of Say It Now, 33 Creative Ways to Say I Love You to the Most Important People in Your Life. And we have today Talena Erickson and Dr. John Duffy. And this is a hugely important topic of talking about teen mental health. And I probably don't even need to say very much more than that because I know that most people are aware of all of the issues. And in fact, right before we, we turn on the record button, we talked about 50 different things that are causing um, such you know, anxiety and depression and fear in our young people. So before I have our two authors introduce themselves, I pulled a quote from each of their books that I just wanted to share as just a way of introduction for our panel today. And the first one is from Talena's book, Unconditional. And I love, Talena, just, I love all of your do's and don'ts at the end of every <laughs> chapter. And this is one of them that I pulled that just jumped out at me. Don't dismiss your child's concerns. If it was something they were able to ignore or deal with themselves, they probably wouldn't have told you about it or probably wouldn't be in interfering with their school, their schoolwork. And I love that. Like, so to really keep our ears open, and I think that this is a big part of what we're talking about is what are we hearing from, from our young people? And then this is from Dr. John's book, Parenting the New Teen in the Age of Anxiety. And he says, you may wonder why our children talk to each other especially when they feel emotions that may be life-threatening. I've asked a number of kids that very question and the answers are unequivocal and strikingly consistent. We parents are too often afraid of their fears, depression, and anxiety. Further, our kids are fully aware of our fear. So they often go elsewhere. Shifting this dynamic is crucial. And I, I thought that you know, one of the reasons I wanted to read that is that this particular conversation, I think is really gonna help us um, and anyone who's a parent or anyone who has young people in their life to maybe feel a little less afraid of what we're hearing, to be less afraid of the anxiety, the depression, their fears. And also, um, as Talena said from in the quote I read, you know, to make sure that we're, we're listening when they come to us and that we're not afraid to have those conversations. So um, let's just start off. Helena, how about if you just introduce yourself and just give us whatever aspect of your work, your book that you'd like to share. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, my name is uh, Telena Erickson and um, I wrote Unconditional uh, in late 2016. It was published in 2017. I recently got a chance to update it in 2022. Um, it is a, a guide for parents, I especially, and this is not to be, um, you know, to exclude everyone, but when I was writing the book, I kept thinking about um, my sister's experience. My sister's a lesbian, um, and what, she grew up in rural Michigan. Uh, my sister's now 60, um, and I just kind of was thinking of a parent in a rural area in the United States, maybe, that didn't have a lot of the resources that we have in larger cities or in urban areas that maybe didn't have access to like, uh, you know, like there's not a pride celebration, there's not anywhere to go to get information. So kind of that's the person or the, you know, uh, you know, audience that I had in mind, but of course for anyone um, who just, you know, wanted some more information. So that is kind of my book and it goes from basically from coming out to, um, you know, to a young adulthood where a child might still need their parents, but kind of transitioning to being on their own and some tips and tricks for doing that. My daughter, Cassandra is, um, is gay, my oldest daughter. Um, and she also suffers from a lot of mental health issues. She also, uh, Sherry, she also has uh, she's also autism spectrum disorder. And on top of all of that, um, she also has celiac disease. So like eating out everywhere is also a nightmare just to kind of, you know, um, uh, throw there. So this uh, topic is not only for, for my family, but um, I, I also um, had a sister, my sister Tanya uh, in 2009 committed suicide. Um, she probably had undiagnosed bipolar disorder. So um, this topic for my entire family and for you know our, our community is just really important to me. And I was super glad to be able to be here. Oh, Selena, thank you so much. Thank you for sharing all that. And uh, 
I know Bree is posting the links to both of our authors' books, and um, there's so much in there. I mean, <clears throat> yeah, we all know young people, even if we don't have them in our, you know, families right at the moment. So thank you, thank you. <clears throat> Dr. John, hi, welcome hi. back. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, so I'll tell you just briefly about, about my work and uh, I'm a clinical psychologist. I work with um, teenagers and their families, their parents primarily. Um, and uh, I had written a book about 10 years ago about being available to your kids as a parent. And um, uh, Brenda at Mango asked me to write about, you know, what are kids going through now? So a couple of years ago, I wrote Parenting the New Teen in the Age of Anxiety. And by new teen, um, I found myself talking about all of the elements of our kids' lives that now take place in the shadows. They're on screens, they're upstairs in their rooms, um, an awful lot of their lives we don't see, we're not privy to, and they are, like you were saying, Sherry, a minute ago, they're sharing with each other, which is great. And I think they're an amazing generation in their willingness to do that, but it can cross into a dangerous territory where we've got 14 year olds taking care of 14 year olds when we really need people who are therapists, you know, involved and parents involved in their lives. So trying to get um, parents more involved and in the know about at least some elements of what, you know, TikTok is or Snapchat or vaping or juuling or whatever else your kids might be up to mm -hmm. or into. Um, and when I published this book in 2019, I thought I have a pretty good beat on what the age of anxiety is for kids. And then I start speaking and this pandemic hits and I'm like, okay, maybe I was off. Maybe I, maybe I didn't capture it perfectly. Um, so I think part of our talk today has to be integrating, okay, how does that, this pandemic play into the anxieties and depression and all the different things that our kids suffer because it's inconsistent and it's kind of all over the map. Um, Talena, one curious uh, thing that you and I have in common that I didn't know until just now is we've both lost siblings to suicide. My younger brother, Tom, died by suicide about 21 years ago. So um, I suspect that, you know, um, what brings people to these tables sometimes is the pain of having lost somebody or having somebody in our lives who's been suffering and kind of getting on a mission to make sure or doing the best we can to make sure nobody suffers quite that way again, if we can do our part. Yeah. yeah, do our part. Yeah, absolutely, John, yeah. Wow, wow, thank you. And and before we went live, Talena and John and I were talking about, you know, that, that it's, it's, it's not even just that the pandemic has happened since you wrote your book, but it's like the political uh, upheavals and the anger and vitriol in our society and the financial instability that is causing a lot of parents a lot of fears. I mean, so it's like we've got, you know, the age of anxiety for our young people. And then we have everything parents are doing. And, and again, we were all talking about like um, that desire somehow to, to fix it, but then the fear of saying or doing the wrong thing. So I'm hoping that as we delve into this a little bit more, and again, I want to say it's not just for parents, it's for anyone who is in a community with young people, right? That we all want to care for our young people. So I don't even know where to start. I'm going to let you guys sort of say like, where do we begin? Is it social media? Is it bullying? Is it the pandemic isolation? How people, how, what do you guys think? John, you want to start us and I'll <laughs> yeah, let, let me let me throw a, a thought or two in. You know, honestly, Sherry, I think it's kind of all of it. You know, um, if you if you can picture the mind of a teenager um, and uh, picture what it was like for us when we were teenagers and how we were able to kind of idealize our lives, idealize our futures, focus on the present. Right, we uh, our scope was probably from here to the weekend you know, in terms of like what we thought about. And our job was just differentiating ourselves from our parents, right? So finding some identity separate and apart from mom and dad. Now, 
you know, we're all carrying around one of these things, right? So we've got the world in the palm of our hands. Mm -hmm. So everything good, bad, indifferent, pornographic, awful, terrifying, every mass shooting that happened 15 minutes ago or is happening in real time right now, our, our nine-year-olds are privy to. And so that idea of the, the luxuriating in youth and, um, uh, and, and, and innocence, our kids don't have that luxury anymore. So I've had parents come up to me after talks and say, sounds like you're kind of blaming the parents for what the kids are going through. And I always want to be really clear. Oh, no, no, none of us made any of this stuff up. <laughs> you know, we're just all trying to navigate this together. Mm -hmm. And we just all want to be as informed as we can and as present and available to our kids as we can. And I suspect something, uh, Talena, that you're going to uh, touch on, but I want to as well, non-judgmental, really open and non-judgmental um, because I've yet to run into the kid. I, I realized the other day, I've worked with about 500 kids over the course of 25 years. And not once can I say, oh, this kid's just trying to test his parents' acumen. That's why they're bringing this problem into the room. No, they're going through something and they're just trying to get an assist. They're trying to get a little help and a little support and a little guidance through it. Yeah, um, I actually just want to start where, where John kind of ended there. I, I think one of the things, and I speak from personal experience here, is, you know, we, and, and again, this is anybody in your family. I'm saying your child because, you know, my, my daughter um, has mental illness, but um, we so want our loved one to just be okay, right? Like, we just want them to be okay. That's like our number one goal. We want them to be okay. And so unfortunately with that impulse comes the ability to deny things or to kind of minimize them, right? So when, just, I'm gonna use a personal example here, you know, Cassandra was experiencing, my daughter was experiencing depression and anxiety and she was recently diagnosed with celiac disease. And so I was like, well, you know, maybe, um, maybe we should wait on the antidepressant and see if she can, you know, if the nutrition, getting nutrition, she was, no longer anemic, she has folic acid and B12, like how much of this is a mental, um, you know, a mental illness versus a physical illness. And of course they completely and utterly overlap, right? But that's kind of my first instinct rather than having my 22, 22 year old daughter, you know, go on antidepressants, but potentially I, was, I, I tried to minimize it. I'm like, Talena, you're being stupid. She should take anything she needs right now to feel better, right? You know what I mean? But that's very much, I think our instinct. And I really had to, you know, fight against that because um, you know, you, you just want everything to be okay. And, and it's not okay, right? Like things, are, things aren't okay. So I think that's one thing I wanted to say. And the other thing I wanted to say is similar to what John said about the not judgmental is that we really have to partner with our loved ones. We can't have some authoritarian, um, you know, kind of idea because whether it's a, you know, a younger brother or sister, or whether it's a aging parent, or whether it's your child, you have to partner with them. You can't just tell them what is best for them, or what is the best course of treatment. You have to be an ally, right? And there's a really great book. Um, it's for very serious mental illness, but I think it's very helpful if someone in your life does seem really stuck. It's called, um, I'm not sick and I don't need help. And um, it's about, you know, people who don't really recognize how bad their mental illness is and how to speak to them. But that's a really, you know, kind of at the severe end of the spectrum where it's not a, a, a child coming to you and saying, I'm depressed and anxious. It's more when you're noticing behavior and the child is saying everything is fine, right? So that's a great book if there's kind of a, a like you suspect bipolar or something of that nature. It's a really wonderful book and I would um, encourage you. But, but in general, we just need to kind of drop the authoritarian thing. And if you're setting some sort of rules or expectation for your, your loved one, you need to kind of explain the thinking behind it and maybe offer some supporting like media. Like there's a really good, um, if, you, if you're talking about screen time, there's a really excellent documentary on Netflix about um, social media use. And I forget what it's called now, but <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm 54, like it all goes. Anyways, um, if anyone wants the name of it, I can look it up on my phone really quickly, but, but it's about, you know, the screen time and losing our concentration and being advertised to all the time and everything. 
So it's really helpful if you're going to say, hey, we're going to leave our phones, we, the parents included, right, we are going to leave our phones downstairs tonight. It's really, um, yes, it's social dilemma. Thank you, Rachel. So, um, um, so it's very handy to say, we're leaving our phones downstairs to charge tonight. We're not taking them up to our room and we're going to watch this, the social dilemma and we're going to talk about it, right? We're going to, I'm not just, you know, going to take your phone from you because you're on it too much that you, you need to partner with your child. So I guess that's, you know, kind of like where I'd like to start. You know, I have a quick question um, before we hear from John and his response to that, Talena, which is, you know, um, I was talking to you guys earlier before we went live about my own son. And um, there's this thing that happens sometimes where it's like, obviously I'm afraid, right? I want him to be okay. I'm so scared. I want to, and, and he's um, in denial, right? And so when you talk about partnering, I hope this is something we can talk about a little bit more too. Like, I'm always wanting, like to me, therapy is so normal and anything we could do for our mental health. I always want to be talking about it. Whereas he's just like, um, I'm, you know, he knows he's not fine because sometimes every once in a while it all breaks down, you know, roller coaster, everything's great. And then, you know, he's just in despair. So I guess that's one thing I'd like to bring in is, yeah, how do we partner when the other person is maybe um, in denial? Yeah, so I think we were talking a little bit before when we were talking about this about, you know, the stigma that that your son and many of our other children and loved ones are getting from our society from perhaps their peer group, depending on who they're hanging out with. Um, you know, and, and it is really wonderful. One of the few good things about the pandemic is I think that seeking mental health has become more um, mainstream. And I think uh, people experiencing anxiety and depression, like I think that has become more, I don't want to say routine, because of course it's horrible and awful, but, but, but it's like, oh, I know what those things are. I'm not so scared of them anymore as it was like 30 years ago. So I think that the, that one of the causes is the, the stigma, unfortunately, for that. And I think, too, that, um, that it's a process. And parents, we tend to think that we have to do everything, you know, by ourselves. This is our kid or whatever. And so, you know, something like a support group, like there's a great group for um, people with autism spectrum disorder called the ASPE. And there's all different sorts of like social supports on there. And a lot of it's unfortunately, both fortunately and unfortunately on Zoom now. So that it's good for, again, those, those, um, those, those kids and loved ones who are in those rural communities who maybe don't have the resources that some of us do, but uh, it's also bad because face-to-face is awesome. So I think it's really important to think about support systems and that's therapy, support groups, um, you know, that might be a class or something like that, that you do together, that might be finding your local chapter of NAMI. Um, and then again, a lot of those are um, on Zoom. Now, NAMI, for those who don't know, are the National Alliance for uh, Mental Illness. And so that is both people with mental illness and their families, their support groups for both. And I highly recommend if you're a parent whose child is truly struggling, perhaps even has been hospitalized or a loved one has been hospitalized, NAMI is a wonderful resource. Unfortunately, I do think it kind of depends on what area you're in, how active your NAMI group is, but you can always find one that is active, right? So like our, our one here in Lansing is very active. We've had people from the west side of the state join via Zoom and stuff because there's they don't offer so many times and so many support groups and stuff. So I think it's... Um, you know, uh, really, um, it's really important to like be there, of course, for your for your loved one, but also recognize that you are going to need some help. And that might be help at the school that might be help from the community. And that might be help from a therapist and from your primary care physician or from a psychiatrist or psychiatric nurse practitioner. And you may have to try a lot of those things before your loved one gets what they need. And that is very discouraging, but it is a process that is absolutely necessary. Thank you, Talena. Thank you. Dr. John, you have anything to add to that? Yeah. Um, first of all, I, lo I love the idea of partnering, right? You know, um, with your loved one, whether it's your child or your brother or sister, or your parent. Um, and 
uh, you mentioned that your your son, for example, is resistant, and this happens a lot, especially with young people. Like you know, there's nothing wrong with me, you know, or I don't want to go to a therapist because what if somebody sees me going in that building? They're gonna know that there's something, you know. Um, and the good news and the bad news is these days we're, we're all pretty unwell. I mean, and I mean that almost in the best possible way, right? I mean, <laughs> in, in a way, like none of us is getting away with not being anxious, not being depressed, not having some attention issues, mm -hmm. not occasionally feeling hopeless. We're all running into this in some way. So <laughs> this, if there is an upside at all to a pandemic, it is that the stigma, though it is mighty, is it's it's starting to erode bit by bit by bit. And um, and I think if you decide to collaborate with your people and say, you know what, um, I need to go and talk to somebody. I think you need to go and talk to somebody. We don't need to, especially initially, we don't need to come up with labels. We don't have to call you depressed or anxious or attention disordered or whatever, you know, just let's go talk through whatever it is that you're going through because it's probably in all likelihood unique and doesn't match the person who's in that meeting after you or the person before you. And so whatever we decide to do and we can keep the word treatment plan out of it and just say the idea, here's what we're gonna do. Here's how yeah. we're going to ease some of the distress that you're under and none of us should be suffering mightily that's part of the reason we have people right that we we want to lift each other up and so i think the way to bring them into the fold is not to say you're deeply depressed you have to go see therapy because i find that especially young people but even people my age are still like no i'm not gonna go you know but if we make it a collaborative effort, let's go, let's talk to them together and let's just see, let's go for a few sessions and let's just see what these people have to offer. Let's just see what this is about. And if you find the right person, NAMI is a great resource here in, in the Chicagoland area and most metropolitan areas, you're right that there are, uh, Telena, that there are places where you've got to travel a little bit, but if you contact NAMI, they'll find the community mental health resources that will be able to help you. Um, and seek those out and um, do your part to do away with the stigma by just going. And, you know, you will, I've yet to run into anybody who was bummed or disappointed that they sought out therapy. So um, I strongly urge people to do it. Wow. I just wanted to, I just wanted to throw in a, a quick quote. It was, I think Dan Perlman tweeted, the stigma behind mental illness is fading as we all become mentally ill. I just thought that was a very ah. appropriate, <laughs> appropriate quote. <laughs> well, and I want to, John, because you said this before actually everyone else came on, and I thought this really struck me when you talked about um, a mother with three children close in age. Can you just say that? Because I think that was really helpful for everyone to hear. Yeah. So um, yeah, I, I work with families and, um, and I happen to work with one family um, and they've got three children, three boys. Uh, one was the class of 2020, um, high school class. One was the class of 2021 and one was the class of 2022. And I think in my field, we want to react as if there's some universal um, response to a traumatic or difficult event let's say a global pandemic, right? Um, and yet when she describes her boys' different experiences, how different it was when you're in the class of 2020 and suddenly your prom is gone, the, the last season, the play, graduation, and there's kind of panic in the air. That's very different than a year later when your son is in the class of 2021 and there's kind of a makeshift graduation put on, but things still feel weird and there are masks and, you know, and then you get your, your guy who's the just graduated, you know, a couple of weeks ago, who maybe has run into some normal times, but his entire high school career has been affected by something none of us could have anticipated. So there is no uniformity in reacting. So um, in my book, I talk about how different it is to be a teenager today than it was a generation ago, but it's different being a teenager today than it was three years ago, you know? So 
anytime we assume that we understand somebody else's experience, no matter what it is, I think we might be making a mistake. And the more we're curious, the more we ask, the better we're going to understand. Because if we think even during the pandemic or during a depression, oh, I totally understand what that's like. I think we're missing something, probably some really, really important things that in order to connect with somebody, in order for somebody to feel heard and held and understood and carried through some of this, you've got to really, really listen and understand their experience and reflect back to them that you really get it. So, you know, unfortunately, we've all got to be makeshift therapists to some extent for our people because there aren't enough therapists. Three years ago, I would have said, we have way too many therapists. We've, we're, we're inundated, we've flooded the market. There's way too many of us. Now, we don't have nearly enough. And I think in the end, that's kind of good news. I hope more of us are seeking it out. Talena, did you wanna jump in? No, I think that that is really excellent. And I, I said this before when we were chatting, but the, the very same, you know, I, my son is, uh, you know, kind of a, a dandelion, I call him, he's a, a sturdy guy and he really struggled in 2020. And I think to anyone who is predisposed through uh, genetics and environment and whatever, just the last couple of years have been um, just really traumatic, right? And I, I don't want us and not that we're going to hear, but I know other people are going to try to downplay that. And I, it really bothers me when I hear this generation referred to as snowflakes and as, you know, just really, um, just really putting these, these young adults down. And, you know, I look at what both my son and my daughter have had to deal with and go through um, in their life. And, you know, part of the, um, the narrative, part of the snowflake narrative is that these kids are able to express it to some degree, right? And we just all had to shove it down, right? Like my, um, I'm the youngest of seven, my oldest sister is 66. So we kind of span from baby boomer down to me, Gen X. And, um, you know, my parents had many issues and we have issues and we just, you just shoved it all down. And then finally, when I got to college, I was like, I think I need to talk about some of these things, right? Like this is, this is because I got to college and I was like, oh, not everyone lives this way. Oh, wow. I think I better go talk to someone about this. <laughs> I don't feel so good. So, um, but that, that's the reason that this, that, that some of this is like, oh, they're complaining about this or they're complaining about that. And, and I actually read a book and I was really surprised it was called the confidence code. And I did not expect generation bashing in that, but I really got some. It was talking about that, you know, we've created this generation without resilience. And I just thought, well, if they're not resilient, they would all be probably dead by now. You know what I mean? So um, it just, that, that, that narrative really bothers me. And I think just as, you know, caring adults in a young person's life, we need to push back against that narrative. And, you know, the, these, these baby boomers and certainly the Gen X as myself, we were not perfect in this regard. Like, my, my, my parents never dealt with a lot of their trauma surrounding the Great Depression and things like that. And then it just sort of gets passed down, right? So, um, but anyways, yeah, I just wanted to add that the, I have a lot of respect for our teens and our, our young adults. I think they are so like caring and funny and um, inventive and imaginative and, um, you know, just the way that the ways that they use technology to create change. Um, I, you know, I have a lot of admiration for them and they're not, they're not, uh, they're not bad or whatever. They're just different, right? Every generation is different and they're just, they're just different, right? We're, we're going to have to get used to the fact that they're different. Just like we were Gen Xers were different from baby boomers. Oh, I love that. John, if it's okay, I have another quote from your book that seems sure. fitting right now that it, it's exactly, I think aligned with what Selena was just saying. Um, children today hold themselves to impossibly high standards, the fallout being an almost inevitable feeling of not being good enough. For one, they consistently feel as if they must possess clarity of purpose, life purpose, sometimes before pu puberty even fully settles in. In their minds, they're failing and feel quite lost if they fail to attain this. And I think, you know, it just, that came up for me. I'm glad I had that written down because to Lena, it's like, um, you know, 
when we're talking about the respect that we have, I mean, you look at this generation and these young people who they have so many like images of what success means coming at them. And, mm -hmm. and I, John, I love that, you know, it's like to think about the standards they're holding themselves to. Yeah. Yeah. yeah no, that, that um, they are holding themselves up sometimes to impossible standards to meet. Um, and part of that is, comes from our generation. Um, in the town where I live, um, there are bumper stickers issued by the high school uh, for every time your kid makes the honor roll. So some people have, if they have three kids, they will have dozens of bumper stickers uh, that say, my kid made the honor roll. And so every kid feels like, oh my gosh. And they're alternating in colors. So if you have like a yellow and a blue one, a yellow and a blue one, and then another blue one, somebody will think, oh my God, that kid must have really messed up that semester. They have these ridiculous standards. Some of that is delineated by us. We want our kids to be successful, but I think we give our kids so many wild images of what success is supposed to look like. And so we don't allow them to kind of like take a deep breath, clear the air, listen to their own hearts and minds and souls and think about what it is that they want out of their lives. What's gonna bring out their greatness and their individuality and their uniqueness. Um, instead, way too often, we're kind of like, um, we're operating out of manuals, like, you know, books like Who Gets In and Why, about like, you know, here's how to get your kid into Yale. And, you know, you've got to get started on the ACT prep when they're in eighth grade. And, you know, you start communicating with the admissions directors by the time they're sophomores and they better be involved in lacrosse and student council and this and that and the other. And your kid might think, well, I'm really good at like the guitar, you know, that that's really where I, my, I think my acumen lies. And so I want to right. do that. But if that doesn't fit in with what our pre-programmed idea is of what makes our kids successful, sometimes we miss it. We miss the important thing that makes them unique and would ultimately make them successful in their minds. And if you ask any parent, and I do this in every initial session I have with kids, uh, families, you know, what do you want for your child? It's usually not like I want them to go to Princeton and I want them to go into finance. You know, it's, it's usually I, I want them to be happy and I want them to be good people and I want them to be kind. And so if we just keep that in mind that, you know, we want, we want our, we want happy people. And that usually means our job as parents in particular mm -hmm. is not to do a whole lot. You know, it really, it, it isn't a very active role. It's usually just being supportive, right? It's being, it's being um, supportive and available as an ally and a guide and a consultant when you're asked. But a lot of it is standing back and nodding and letting them do their thing and find their way and make their mistakes and prove that they're competent and resilient and all the things that we know they are. Because boy, do I agree with uh, uh, Talena about the idea that, if we think this generation isn't resilient and competent and capable, man, have we are we looking at them sideways because this group is brilliant. I, I'll just throw out my, my favorite example of this is, I think it was within two days of the Parkland shooting where a number of the kids who were in the classrooms where those shots were fired were in front of microphones pleading to Congress to do something about common sense gun laws. Yes. And I just think like, I, I was around, you know, doing this job when Columbine happened. And, you know, like those kids mostly did what you would expect people to do. What I would do if there was a shooting near me, I would just curl up in a ball for several months and work through the trauma of that. And these kids were like fighting through that in order to make sure this doesn't happen again. <sighs> That is not a snowflake generation. <laughs> and, and look at the backlash that they have suffered, John, right? Look at the pushback and the backlash they have suffered and they have weathered that and continued on their journey. So uh, what an excellent example. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I just um, wanted to add um, when John was talking about the, you know, honor rule stickers or whatever, this is something that I've dealt with myself. Both my husband and I are pretty quote unquote high achieving people, whatever that means. You know, my husband has a master's degree in economics. I have my MFA in creative writing. You know, I was a professor at Michigan State for, for many years. My 
husband, you know, was moved around in his career quite a bit and done well. And um, one of the things that I had to really examine, because we're also in a very competitive school environment, East Lansing is uh, a, a home to a lot of professors, kids at Michigan State University, you know, and everyone's got a PhD or advanced degree. But I really had to examine this because I was feeling the exact same way. You know, I wanted my kids to do really well and get whatever cord at graduation, all the other stuff. And the conclusion that I came to, and this is something that I had to journal about and write about was all that competition that I felt and that insecurity I felt, those were my issues, right? Those were my issues as a mom. They weren't, they had nothing to do with my kids, right? Um, and both my kids wanted to do well in school. You know, they both were, were, were fairly good at school, you know, the structure of school and, um, both had, um, you know, those attributes that we value at school, you know, and I'm not saying those are the most important attributes because they're not, but there is a certain set of skills that you have in our current public school system that help you navigate that. If you read pretty fast, if you don't have ADHD, you know what I mean? There's just a certain set of kind of box skills and, and both my kids had those, those skills. Um, but the, all that competition that I felt like if they're not gonna have this, it was all my own insecurity. Like if they don't have that X cord at graduation or if they don't have this thing, that doesn't mean I'm a bad parent, right? Or that doesn't mean that they're not a good kid. So you just have to do that internal work. And, and the same with, you know, with, with if your child is struggling, well, yes, part of it might be your parenting, whatever that means. And you might have to switch how you parent. You might have to do that give and take. But part of it is this is a very challenging time. Um, this is a very scary environment for all of us. And that doesn't mean that your kid is bad or that you're bad or anything. This is just something that has happened in your life. And I'm still internalizing this, of course, because you, when your kid hurts, you hurt, you know, you just feel like someone has just ripped out your heart and like just crushed it in front of you, like one of those action movies, right? Like Terminator, you know, um, but, but honestly, you have to look at it is, you know, if your kid trips and falls doing a sport that they love and they break their wrist, you're not going to tell them, oh, you can't play soccer anymore because you fell and broke your wrist, you know, like it's too dangerous. I suppose if it was a concussion in football. We talk about that, but in general, if it's something that the child really enjoys doing and they love and they hurt themselves, we encourage that they get back in the metaphorical game, right? Well, life is a lot like that, right? And, and just because you're having this challenge, it doesn't necessarily mean that there's someone to blame, right? It doesn't mean that you're to blame. So you need to let go of that, that insecurity so that you can help your child, right? And help yourself too, right? Do your own work so that you're not taking all this stuff so personally, because then you're not going to be able to sleep at night either. And you're going to need whatever anti-anxiety medication, you know, too. So you just have to like, and not that that's a bad thing. I was making a joke about medication, but only because there's so much of it in our household. But anyway, um, but anyways, but, but my point is you have to do, you have to do your own, your own work so that those fears and insecurities don't become your child's fears and insecurities. Uh, I really appreciate that, Elena. You know, and just when you were talking, I was thinking again, like thinking broader community, you know, like what, what are we as a culture, right? What are we holding up as these ideals of success? And, you know, like, and again, you know, our household is the opposite. It's like, we just, you know, we're constantly just wanting our son to just, he pursues like things that he really loves, but it's like, he, he just won't, you know, it's like, like he's currently trying to learn Hebrew over the summer, two years worth of Hebrew in French, you know, <laughs> because he has this like idea of, you know, he, he needs to stand out somehow. And uh, that's to me heartbreaking. You know, it's great if he wants to do it, but when it's for the, like, I need, like, I need to somehow stand out, you know, dot, dot, dot. So I feel like our culture could do a better job somehow. I don't even know what that would look like. Yeah. Maybe you guys have some ideas. How do, how do we? <laughs> that's, that's just so hard because I think it's coming from several places. It's coming from our like fame culture, our 15 minutes of fame culture. It's coming from social media. Um, it's coming from being very, very rewarded in today's um, world. If you do stand out, you don't even really need to be uh, good at anything, right? And I forget who it was. Um, 
I can't remember if it was Will Ferrell or if it was somebody else, but somebody at the um, Nickelodeon or MTV Awards or something said once, I'm not particularly handsome. I'm not particularly talented. So thank you for this award or whatever. And so I feel like that that has happened a lot and our some has got a lot of attention for just being edgy or standing out in some way, right? Whatever that is, academically, uh, uh, physically, um, you know, I remember seeing a video on Instagram of a woman lifting like these, like, I don't know, she had an enormous amount of weight, like 50 or hundred pounds. And she was wearing these like stiletto heels and lifting weights. And I'm like, why, why is this happening? You know what I mean? Like, you know what I mean? But she was proving she could lift the weight and the heels and the, the, the video had like 1.8 million views, you know? So it's a really tough one, Sherry. And I don't blame your son at all for wanting to stand out, but we have literally, um, that has literally been, you know, uh, whatever that has been encouraged by, by, um, our attention economy. Right. And it is very difficult to remove our attention economy from these lovely devices which I listened to an audiobook this morning while I was at the gym on it. And then later in the day, I got directions for a store that I didn't know where it was at that had just opened in Lansing. And um, then my sister who um, has COPD texted me and she's fine and that's all good. But so all those good things happened with this lovely device but a bunch of bad stuff happens with this device too that a lot of programming takes place that again, like John said, the parents and the families are not a part of. John, yeah, do you want to I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll throw in there that, you know, um, we, we've, we're using the terms and, and we all use them. Um, the idea of, you know, a good kid versus a bad kid, a good parent versus a bad parent. And um, I, I think if we can kind of pull some of that judgment out of you know, the way we look at each other, you know, um, it's really tough. And I think these answers come at a glacial pace when we want them to come fast. Uh, <laughs> but to Telena's point, um, we do have these devices and these devices for better or worse, speed messages up, right? We get, you know, you get hashtag no bad parent, you know, trending and all of a sudden, that's becomes, you know, part of the stigma and part of the vernacular and, and part of the discussion. Mm -hmm. And so um, I, I think, you know, just like the, um, the, the stigma is slowly melting away, I think we can get to a point where um, there is no bad kid. There's just different mm -hmm. kids uh, who think differently and act differently and want different things for themselves. And for better or worse, I think a lot of the answer lies in this younger generation because um, speaking for myself, when I think about how we behaved in high school um, toward each other, uh, we weren't always kind. And I'm understating that by uh, quite a bit. Um, and we were ex you know, exclusive and, and clicky and, and bullying. And, um, and if you talk to a 16 year old now, if you wanna feel heartened about like, socialization of young people, if you talk to a 16 year old now about inclusivity, um, about, you know, caring for one another, about, about what's happening in the Ukraine right now, which, you know, if this, if we were kids, I think I would be like, I think some, I think there might be a war, but I'm not sure, you know, now kids are like, you know, trying to rally, you know, like, let's send some things over to Poland for some of the refugees that are there. Um, these kids are smart and thoughtful and industrious. So they're looking at TikTok and Instagram and the way things go viral. And um, just speaking about my field there, if you looked at, you know, um, adolescent eating disorders or depression or anxiety, there are kids helping kids through these difficulties and letting them know, hey, you're not alone. There's a whole bunch of us out here and here's what's working for me to help get through this. And then somebody else will throw a video up. Here's what's working for me. And too often we're talking about all the awful things, right? That are on there. And there's plenty of them. You know, we, we, could, we could spend the rest of our lives watching online pornography and never get through it, you know? Um, or, you know, just awful videos of violence. But 
a lot of these kids are using this stuff to move the needle in a really positive direction toward kindness and acceptance and inclusion. And so I think the tide changes as these kids get older, um, because I think they're going to be a generation that doesn't tolerate um, anything short of kindness and inclusion. And, um, and that's no small thing. You know, I, I, I think globally something changes that I can't even quite predict that's good about this generation. Oh, John, that was so beautiful. You brought in that heart wisdom, John. You really did. You brought it in. You brought it home. So. See, we were getting dark and you brought us back. You brought you brought us back. So but but yeah, I would just add to that, it's a tool, right? All these wonderful and scary technology things, they're tools, right? And they just have to be tools and not our not our lives and not our kids' lives. And I my generation needs to know that too. I see plenty of people my age glued to their device. And we just have to remember they're tools, right? They are tools. Right. And also what I love so much, John, about what you brought in is it goes back to that place of, we don't have to fix anything. You know, in fact, we can't, and it's not our job. And right, just, but it also like, talk about a heart wisdom, like to, again, what Talena was saying about really respecting our youth and, and what you just said, I just felt my heart like grow, like, oh, you know, they'll take care of themselves. They'll take care of each other. You know, and like you had said, you know, we're here, we can guide, we can support, but they're, they're so smart in so many ways that, that our generation doesn't, doesn't have. And, and just to throw one quick thought in, it's messy, um, you know, like finding out who you are, how you're going to play your role in this world, um, how you move the needle can be really messy. And, and we have to keep in mind that, you know, through those teen years, they're developing, they're, they're changing. And so, you know, we can, we can be really, really frustrated with them and expect them to know things because they're smart and because they're worldly and they've learned so much from Google, you know, um, but they're still kids and they're still learning as they go. So um, they might be adamant about some point and we might want to tell them, no, you're wrong about that. This is what's true. But if we show some respect for their point of view before we share our own, then, then we're collaborating again. Then we're working together. If we don't, then we're shutting them down, shaming them. And their point of view becomes kind of morphs into something akin to depression, anxiety, um, and a deep feeling of of aloneness that is not at all comforting and probably stifles that um, uh, moving forward, that, that, that maturation that we want to see in our kids. Yeah, I would just, I would just add that, you know, a lot of parents, caring parents, you know, they're, they're not particularly happy when their two-year-old throws themselves down on the carpet or rolls around in the aisle of the store. You know what I mean? Like that, that is not a, a moment of joy for any of us as parents, right? Where you have to kind of pick the child up and either like leave the store or try to tuck them back in the cart or tuck them under your arm and hi, just, you know, me in the Cheerio section. But parents who are, are, are caring and who know that this is just a fact of a two-year-old, this is your own fault a lot of the times because they didn't have their nap or you didn't bring a snack or you didn't bring the right color of goldfish or whatever the hell happened, right? Um, uh, that caring parent then takes a 16 year old um, sarcasm or what, you know, the older generation would call mouthy. My dad would say, are you getting mouthy? You know, so, but they take that 16 year olds, uh, you know, sarcasm so personally, like so deeply personally, like I've, I've raised this, you know, again, this bad kid, no such thing. Right. So I've raised this, like whatever, I haven't done a good job. They're mouthing off to me. But it's no different than that two-year-old who's rolling around in the grocery store, right? And you didn't blame the two-year-old for being two, and you can't really blame the 16-year-old for being 16. And I, I think that's what I just wanted to express that they are clear developmental stages, and you can't expect a 16-year-old to act like a 25-year-old. And now I'm going to put on my professor hat here. Like so many times at Michigan State, the difference I would have a student when they were a freshman in college at 18. And then that student might come back around to like my advanced creative, you know, 
readings in nonfiction when they were 22. And the difference between those students between 18 and 22 was absolutely remarkable. Okay, that is the human brain, that is our development, that is how we are wired. And again, as a parent, we can't take that personally. Yes, it's of course you can have respect and boundaries and ask them to, to not talk to you in a certain way. Of course, that's all completely legitimate. But you also, again, you can't take it so personally. Just remember when something like that happens, of course, address it, address your boundary, address the respect or whatever's there. But then just remember that that two-year-old rolled around and they got past that, right? They got, they got past the, you know, you're not going to buy me the sugary cereal, so I'm going to throw myself down on the ground. They, they got past that and they will get past this too. Thank you. That was great. Oh, that was so great. I love that, Selena. Rachel, I think you might have had a question. I did. Um, my, I have a 15-year-old and a 16-year-old right now. And one of the things that they, well, my daughter has had to experience twice now is gun violence at 15 and so um and then with the mass shootings and I mean one was at a we were at a um youth football game and so we were all running so and then they're seeing these things on tv which obviously feel real once you've experienced the running aspect of it and know the fear um you know, PTSD kicks in all this kind of stuff. And what I've been noticing is the lack of conversation <laughs> on PTSD with what kids are oh. seeing because of the increased mm -hmm. gun violence in that kids are having to see. And um, I was just wondering, you know, anything <laughs> to help kids navigate that part you know I was diagnosed with PTSD as a 17 year old so I recognize stuff because mm -hmm. I it's it was my experience mm -hmm. but it's hard because it's different and with the gun violence now and things that they're seeing even I'm like um okay I need to shut my mouth say how are you feeling <laughs> listen to the answers but then not give advice. And, and that to me is really hard. And I, but I don't know what else to do <laughs> to help. So anything that comes with that. Yeah, um, I'll throw a thought out here, Rachel. First of all, I'm so sorry that you and your child have witnessed gun violence. I mean, how, how awful and what what a what a comment on what we're looking at here as a society that there are just a few of us speaking here and one of us has actually been party to what that this is a scourge on our on our culture um and uh i can say having um worked with a lot of families who um haven't even experienced gun violence directly but indirectly through the news or um just through drills at school um, and you can sense the discomfort of, of parents and the other grownups and kids' lives around talking about this. And I think it's one of the few things where um, I've ever run into in all these years where the adults don't have answers, you know, like they don't know what the right answer is. And they also can't say, oh, yeah, that happened to those kids down in uh, in Texas. Those ha that happened to those kids in Florida, and in Colorado. But that's that's not going to happen to you. Mm -hmm. Our kids are smart. They're discerning. They get the randomness of it. Um, they get that it could happen anywhere, anytime. They get that they're going through drills for a reason. And what I find gives kids comfort isn't quite the right word, but some element of completion and some even if it's a little management of that trauma is to talk about it, is to talk about, you know, what it's like to go through the drill, what it's like to see that another one has happened or to look at your phone during a class and see like, oh, this is happening at another school somewhere in the United States right now. What's that like? Cause we don't know, you know, um, and to let them let the line on, on that a little bit and talk about their trauma because the, the treatment for trauma by and large is processing it, talking about it and not ignoring it, which 
I think sometimes when we don't have answers, we just want to brush it off. It's going to be okay. We're fine. There's look for the helpers. There's helpers everywhere. You know, I think we were all getting sick of the Mr. Rogers line, um, even though it's, yeah. it's a good one. Um, but let your kids talk about this stuff. Ask them what their thoughts are. Ask them what they think, what they think we ought to do. Uh, if there are any answers, you know, if they're uh, short of like profiling every child or, you know, uh, the good guy with a gun thing, you know, ask them what they think broadly and they might, you might disagree with them, but engage in the conversation. Cause I think if we take that aside and we make it taboo, just like with any topic at all, then that becomes scarier. It becomes scarier for not willing to talk about it because I think our kids begin to think, oh, this is worse than I even thought. Mm -hmm. Instead of thinking, oh, that we're working on it. We're working it through. Even here at the dinner table, we're working it through. And so it's important that they know that we're aware of it. We respect that they're going through something and, that, and we acknowledge that we are too and that we're scared too and we're worried about it and we're willing to work together to think about solutions. That's the best I think we can do at this point. Yeah, that's, that's really great, John, absolutely. And the other thing that I would, I would add to that is trauma's effects on the body, right? Um, so I think I would emphasize while keeping those communication channels open and talking like John was saying, I would also um, encourage maybe, um, you know, talking about the effects of trauma on the body and what that does. I know this sounds, I don't mean for this to be, be reductive or anything like that, but this is honestly something that works really well for trauma is um, any sort of somatic work, uh, yoga, um, anything, there's, there's YouTube videos, but our body needs to complete that circuit. And if you can talk about that with your teens and say, you know, shake your, shake your body, like, you know, we, we need to complete that circuit and, and what, and what, you know, um, and, and obviously, you know, uh, again, therapy would be absolutely wonderful or, or some sort of support group, but, you know, say, you know, when you're, you know, shaking is very therapeutic, stretching is very therapeutic, and then tie in the body to those conversations in some way and let them know, because I was very, very, <laughs> I was scarily old when I realized how much trauma was stored in our bodies just by not completing that circuit. And, to do some simple stretches and to actually think about it, to just shake your body when things have been, you know, uh, you know, stressful or whatever, and to find some way to to link that up and offer that resource to them, I think um, would just be, you know, helpful. And again, you know, it's I'm just so sorry that you and your family have um, have gone through this and. Um, you know, I, I think that there's a great book. It's really hard to get through. So if you like audiobooks, I think it's good. It's a good one to do on audiobook, but it's called The Body Keeps the Score. And, um, uh, you know, it's it's very dense, you know, when you start, oh, you got it. <laughs> yeah. You got it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. And, um, yeah, and uh, anyways, but that's some great things about the somatic connection and about um, the talking and uh, finding those those uh, the, the people that they might um, you know have have that in common with whether that's online or, or somewhere local so um, but I wish you the the best of luck and um, I will keep them in my prayers so Wow thank you thank you Rachel for bringing that up that was really important and I'm sad to say that we are at the end of our hour. I, I could just be here for five or six or eight or 24 more hours listening to what you two have to share because so much valuable information. And I, I think for me, like the, the biggest thing is I started off by, by bringing in the quote from John's book about parents being afraid, right? And so, and, and here we ended up back again, right at the end, like not to be afraid not to be afraid to talk about this for ourselves and with and for the young people. And I think I'm so grateful, um, John and Talena, to you and to everyone else who's here, to Mango Publishing for, for being willing to take the time and to have this kind of conversation. Really appreciate it so much. I'm gonna do whatever I can to, to spread this replay around so people can take advantage of it. Thank you, Sherry. And I, yeah, I thank you, so Selena. Much. This is yeah. this is this is great. Yeah, thanks, John. I'm looking forward to reading your book. I'm sorry I didn't read it before here. It sounds excellent. So. Same. I can't wait to read yours. <laughs>
Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you. We are here every Wednesday. Please come back. It's always so helpful and so full of wisdom and heart. Thanks Thank again, Sherry. Okay. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you.